I feel good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I knew that I would. Okay. <laughs> Maybe we'll leave that part in. <laughs> okay. Three, two, one. Welcome back to The Peaceful Truth, the podcast where we talk about feminism, women empowerment, women's issues, and more. But today's episode is all about the quarter life crisis. We're talking about your 20s and what you go through and the difficulties that you go through. So let's get started. Let's go. All righty. Oh, we forgot to introduce ourselves. I'm Kenzie. I'm Megan. Okay. Welcome if you're a first time listener. Okay, so how's your week? What's new? My week was really good. Um, I was busy pretty much every night this week, but some key points. I got acupuncture for the first time. Oh my gosh, how how was it? Like, it was amazing in every sense of the word. Why did you get it? Like what motivated you to get it? My lower back. Oh, you have pain? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, you threw it out. Mm-hmm. Is it feeling better this it week? Feels- it feels so much better. No way. So I got acupuncture on Tuesday and she also did some of that cupping. Remember like Michael Phelps had, you know, those like <gasps> yeah. big purple circles that Michael yeah, Phelps like, had on his back. Yeah, yeah, So she did that to me too. And it was really, really cool. And so did it then hurt? it looks like it didn't it hurt. No, it didn't hurt, but it felt really weird. And my like she did it on my upper back and it felt just totally relaxed after she did it. And she warned me and said, okay, you're going to feel really loopy. Like, take your time getting up. Get up slowly. And I was like, yeah, whatever. You know you know how you feel after a massage? You're kind of like, ah, I'm in la-la land. Mm. Um, but with acupuncture, like, multiply that feeling by a thousand. Really? Yes. Like, you are loopy as F. Why? I don't know. I've heard some people don't believe in it, like, straight yeah. up. Straight up, some I did research on it after I did it, which is weird. I should have done it before. But some people straight up are like, this is not real. This is cr- crazy talk. And you know what? That's fine for people to believe that. And maybe it is crazy talk, but I don't care. Do you feel different? Did I like, I'm genuinely cur- curious because I actually, my insurance covers it. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. It, it, my, I'm like super pumped because I actually have like back pains and stuff and some issues. They cover chiropractor work, acupuncture work, and massages. That's really cool. Like psychology type things because my business is kind of in the medical field a little bit. Mm-hmm. And so like they cover everything. Oh my gosh, we have a guest. <laughs> Binks is on the table. Binks is on the table. <laughs> Welcome Binks. So Binks is my little black kitty cat. Black cat. He's so cute. He's like a Halloween kitty cat. Um, You should do it though. Really? Especially if your insurance is covered. Just try it one time and see what you think. Mm. And so I said, I'm really glad like my boyfriend is picking me up and I don't have to drive. That's how loopy you are. No way. Oh, nobody. And she said, <laughs> it's called the acupuncture high. Mm. Mm-hmm. That's really cool. I know. Well, I might try it then. You should try it at least one time. Just see what you think and then make your own opinion, you know? Yeah. How was yoga this week? Yoga was so good. I taught um, Tuesday and Thursday on a rooftop in downtown Those roof- Seattle. Follow us on Insta. Um, she does like stories and stuff every day and her pictures of her rooftop classes are insane. It's so cool doing yoga on a rooftop. So yeah, we did some sun salutations on Tuesday. And then I said, you know what? We're going to do moon salutations on Thursday because nobody ever does moon salutations. And it was really good. And then today was the best day of all. I played my harmonium and chanted for my favorite yoga class ever. How did, what did they say? How, what did they feel? Um, everybody that was there, we had like 15 students and it's called yoga church. That's the name of the class is yoga church. And so it I is kind of, I'm obsessed with that. That's awesome. It is more of like the spiritual community. Mm-hmm. Um, you still get a full workout with Terry Lynn. Terry Lynn's the teacher. Would I like it as an agnostic? Would I like? I think you would. Really? Because I'm spiritual. Yeah. Like I'm not ruling out life in general. Right. So. But the thing that you do have to be open to is that whenever we're chanting with the harmonium, we are chanting to the Hindu deities. Oh, okay. And we just say like, about that. we just have a couple of... This time we chanted to Krishna and Rama and Ganesha. You probably know Ganesha. He's the big fat elephant with the really big belly. Cool. Yeah. How cool is that? I just said it's cool like so far away from you. <laughs> cool. 
So, um, and the best part is, is that Terry Lynn, the teacher really liked it. And she said, what if you come back like whenever you want to? And so I'm already going to do it again, August 12th, August 13th, Sunday, August 13th. So was someone else teaching the class and you were doing the harmony? Okay. I thought you were multitasking. I was not multi. That would be crazy. I was like, dang girl, you, you're <laughs> talented. I would not be. That's like patting your head and rubbing your stomach at the same time. Terry Lynn taught and then I was chanting pretty much the whole time. And then they would like hold a pose for a really long time and chant with me then because I was doing the same chant over and over and over. And so they knew the words then. They learned the words. And so then Terry Lynn would have them hold a pose for a a good you know minute or two and they would chant along cool yeah it was really fun that's super legit um so and then yesterday where'd you go oh we went to whidbey island we surprised that's Desmond. in canada it's no? in america it's oh. on the washington side sorry no that's okay we I did have confused. to take a ferry oh okay i mm-hmm. i get confused about the canadian border because i'm used to the mexico border. <laughs> <laughs> um so Jeff, which is Desmond's brother-in-law, surprised Amanda, which is his wife and Desmond's sister, and said, okay, we're going to Whidbey Island, but he didn't tell Amanda that we were going to meet them for dinner, and so we met them for dinner, and we were like, surprise, and Amanda was so excited, and we stayed at dinner for like a good three hours, just talking, talking, drinking wine. Oh, perfect. Drinking Crown and Coke, my favorite. Oh, wow. You cool (laughs) little whiskey drinker. (laughs) How was your week? Um, yeah, good. Um, I, at work, I accomplished a lot. Um, and I did one of my first, so I'm a video producer. Um, and at work, I shot my first shoot. And I led my first shoot this week. And nice. it went well. Good. So, and I got positive feedback from my mentor, which was good. Um, and she's a really awesome lady, by the way. She is a rock star, um, a good mentor. Um, I think she listens to the podcast, so oh, she cool. gets the shout out. Um, and then after, uh, by the way, she might be, want to be in the podcast. She's like, loves feminism. Perfect. She's a guest. Um, and so, yeah. And then, so that was accomplishments at work and really positive at work. And then... Uh, I got to catch up with, uh, Rob, uh, who is one of our Aaron's best friends and Aaron's my brother-in-law. And I've been, obviously Aaron's been in my life for like 10 years, as long as he's been with Chelsea. And so I got to know his friends and they kind of also became mine. Mm -hmm. It's like one big happy family of friend group of friends. Um, and Megan knows all of them. And so we've known Rob for a long time and I haven't seen Rob in like maybe a few years I don't even remember like Rob and I couldn't remember but um I got to see him and catch up with him on Friday night and so that was nice to see him and he has his own podcast with Aaron we've talked about it before but it's called Still Got Nothing if you want to go check it out um and then what else did I do or is Rob staying here in this house he was they went to Portland I think for a wedding possibly I might be talking out of my butt right now I don't know why but now they're in Portland I guess or going home now because it's then um and then uh, ended the weekend uh because it's the end. <laughs> and then I kind of got back into cycling this oh, week oh nice which I'm actually super pumped about um so like last summer literally a year ago I it was kind of a spiritual experience because growing up I wasn't like that into sports and I didn't really do sports um or anything athletic to be honest um I was like more of in student council and leading like student government type things but um I challenged myself to do a hundred miles cycling ride. Cause in general, I've, I like biking and I take, took a few spin classes and I'm like, why the heck not? Why not? I can do a hundred miles. I just, <laughs> I just made a decision. It was so weird. I was just like in like May of that year in the rides in August, late August. I was like, I'll train for this. Yeah. I'm going to do it. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> and so is that a normal amount of time? It seems short to me. May to it August. is short, I think. Um, but I like literally every single day after work, I even had like printed out a training regimen online of like working your way up in that certain amount of time. Mm-hmm. And so I did that every single night after work. And so it was kind of like, and it's long rides. I know. How many hours after work would you have to do? Like an hour or two. But I would just like, and it stays light, lightly and obviously in the summer. So I had enough time, but it was, uh, 
I would just like listen to music and like really just be in the zone. And I like studied my body and it was like really interesting because like if you go, it's like all about endurance, you know, and not about like necessary. Well, I guess endurance and strength go hand in hand, but it's more about endurance. And so I learned a lot about my body of like what it when my body needs something and like hydration and I learned Mm -hmm. about fueling and I learned about electrolytes and so like learning my body and then like just dedicating my mind because it's like a mind thing that you also have to get over to be able to push yourself that far and so it was kind of a spiritual experience for me and I like learned a lot about myself through that and but after it happened it was so difficult doing that 100 mile ride that I just kind of put my bike up, which I kind of am sad about that I did. But like this past week, I redid my bike. My neighbors are really big into cycling and he saw me messing with my bike and he fixed it up real fast and I took it for a ride and then I took several spin classes this week. So I feel good about it and I'm happy. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes whenever you have such a feat like that, then you just need to give yourself a little bit of a break. Yeah. How, how long did it take you to do a hundred miles? Like I did it with my friend Miguel, um, who was, a videographer at the station at my last television station that I worked at and so we were friends because your videographers do like work all day together um but uh it took me like nine hours him and I oh my god and he just didn't train but like no Miguel is like one of those guys who just like is or women who's like super athletic and anything he picks up is just like oh that's easy he did not train at all no like we went on one ride together oh my gosh so nice job nice job to both of you guys yeah and so I was like annoyed at him and he thought it was hilarious because like I had been working so hard and he was like oh this is fine (laughs) uh so yeah but yeah okay so today uh is we're talking about the quarter life crisis or floundering in your 20s and I think that we thought of this because it happened to both of us yeah under very different circumstances yeah And so then we were like, I think that the majority of women and men are going through this crisis and maybe not even talking about it. No. Yeah, for sure. And um, a lot of this one and I feel kind of I don't mean to like, I don't know. I feel like though when podcast people want to hear about it, but we're going to be basing it on our own experiences. But I kind of feel self-centered at times for doing that. Yeah. I mean, I got a rough story. Yeah, but it's like, it's real life. So, it's real life. Uh, let's just relate to it. But we're also just laying off some facts of articles where yes. it relays back to it. Yes. So, and we're just giving examples. So I found an article that The Guardian published by Amelia Hill. It's called The Quarter Life Crisis, Young, Insecure, and Depressed. <laughs> so basically, the thought is, is that your 20s are supposed to be a time of opportunity and adventure before mortgages, marriages, and kids take their toll on your life. But 20s... <laughs> take a toll on your life? That's horrible. I know. <laughs> but really, that's I want what it you to be think. happy. You think that the 20s are like you running around in fields and doing crazy stuff. So, but this article is saying that 20-somethings do have their fear of sh- struggles. These include anxiety about jobs, unemployment, debt, and relationships can lead to the quarter-life crisis. And oddly, they're very similar to the actual midlife crisis. So you can feel insecure, depressed, lonely, and disappointed. And I would say that during my quarter-life crisis, I felt all of those things. Mm Mm-hmm. So I think that that is true. I did too. I think the only thing, but I want to touch on it because my friends have, um, the only thing I didn't luckily knock on wood was employment, unemployment. That's true. Neither of us, did you? I didn't, I chose to be unemployed. Oh, okay. But then you got a job when you tried. But then I got a job whenever I was putting myself back on the market. And I'll definitely go into that more later. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Me too. Career stuff that we both went through. Um. Yeah. And actually, just thinking about it like a few weeks ago, sorry for interrupting, a few weeks ago when we were like hanging out at uh, the brewery in Belltown, we were talking about how we both had those experiences of like ex- existential crises with our careers. Mm-hmm. And uh, we were kind of both talking about that because we're both passionate about our jobs. Like that's an important part of our lives. It each kind of, of us. like 
oddly defines us and I don't mm-hmm. know if that's the best thing but for some reason it just defines both of us feel I that am. way yeah. yeah both of us yeah so uh, from the same article they interviewed a doctor named Dr. Oliver Robinson and he said quarter life crisis don't happen literally a quarter of the way through your life. They occur a quarter of your way through adulthood in the period between 25 and 35, although they tend to cluster around the age of 30. So mine happened when I was 24-ish. Mine was a little earlier than that. And then yours? I feel like I go through it. I'm just, I'm not like, I, I, I am happy right now and a hundred percent, like I'm not depressed, but I still have anxiety and I feel like, um, I'm 25 though. And so you maybe you're in the middle of it. I, I like still feel things about it, but you still did. Like we're talking about your career thing. That's true. Yep. Yeah. Um, Dr. Robinson, um, conducted research with professionals from Birkbank college and they also backed a survey from gumtree.com and in this survey they questioned 1,100 young people and found the following 86 percent of those surveyed admitted feeling under pressure to succeed in their relationships finances and jobs before hitting the age of 30 all those things you feel pressure before the age of 30 absolutely 32% felt under pressure to marry and have children by the age of 30. Well, I mean, that's two years from now for me. Better knock those babies out. (laughs) Yeah, we're going to talk more uh, more about about your past here soon. But did you feel pressure to make that decision? Did you feel like you pressured yourself like... Um, I honestly always said that I didn't want to have kids and my ex-husband did want to have kids. Um, and I think that if I was still married, we probably would have had kids by now. Yeah. No, not kids. I mean, pressured yourself, I guess, to be married at that young age. Do you feel like you thought you had to get married at that age? No, no way. I did not feel like I had to get married. I wanted to get married. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, and then 21% wanted a complete career change. They were like, get me out of my current job. So... That's kind of a little bit high, like for that many people to say, I don't like my current career and to just do a complete 180. Mm -hmm. But there is good news. Dr. Robinson found that the quarter life crisis only lasts an average of two years, which in in the grand scheme of life isn't too long. Mm -mm. And it can end up being a really positive experience. So the crisis can end up eventually building and cementing a new life for yourself that you may not would have found if you wouldn't have gone through the crisis. I agree. So that's good news. And then I also found this really other cool quote. It's from Damien Barr, the author of the book, Get It Together, A Guide (laughs) to Saving Your Quarter Life Crisis. Damien said, plenty of people are going to say that quarter life crisis doesn't exist. The truth is that our 20s are not as they were for our parents. 10 years of tie-dye fun and quality me time. Being 20-something is crazy. Fighting millions of other graduates for your first job, struggling to raise a mortgage deposit, and finding time to juggle all of your relationships. Exactly. Wow. Okay, so should we go through mine? Are you good? Yeah, you go through yours. Okay. Are you done with yours? Okay, cool. So I kind of think, and this is just my personal thought, that it's a time of trial and error. Um, But I have two quotes from a USA Today article about being in your 20s. Um, So while 9% of the American adult population suffers from depression, that number is closer to 11% among ages from 18 to 24. That's pretty high. That's pretty high. Biological factors also come into play. Um, So I'm kind of reading this verbatim, but in the last few years, scientists have noted that in the frontal lobe, so the front part of your brain, doesn't completely develop until the mid-20s. That means 20-somethings are faced with making some huge decisions when they aren't ready uh, yet at their full cognitive capacity, which can cause feelings of angst and anxiety. So we're not who we're tr- truly going to be until the mid twenties, due to our maybe even load. more, yeah. Story time. Story time. So, Megan, what is this story? And actually, I don't think it, I we've like had a friend sit down and talk about it. Like, I don't think I've heard this story even. Really? Yeah. 
Okay, I'll tell it. Okay. So I dated a man from the age of, I met him when I was 16, and he was 16. We probably met earlier than that, but that's when we started to date. And um, we fell in love, and we were in a very committed relationship through high school and all the way through college. And that was a really big feat because... I went to Texas A&M, and he stayed back in Austin, and so we did a little bit of a long-distance relationship for five years because I was going to school at A&M, I got my bachelor's, and then I got my master's at A&M as well, and so five years long-distance relationship, and during this whole time, um, I felt overall like it was a really solid relationship. I loved him, and I think he loved me. <laughs> and you don't know for sure? Looking back, I don't know. Uh, the whole time, or just he fell out of it? I think, I don't know. Because I have a relationship where I think he fell out of love, but I knew he was in love for sure at one point. I think he thinks that he was in love. Um, after you, after you, I tell you what he did to me, then maybe you can say he doesn't really know what love is even is wow um so he was the reasons that I loved him he was really kind to me but he wasn't necessarily kind to other people and so looking back on that that was a really big um that should have been a really big red flag for me like why is why can he only be kind to me and why can he only express his true self to me because with me he was always really goofy I was really goofy, but then when around other people, it was like a switch would turn and he would be another different person. And so just looking back on it, those were a little bit of red flags. Um, But during the time that we were together, I never felt, um, I felt like I could trust him. I honestly, I did five years of long distance with him and I felt like I could trust him. And um, he proposed to me in February of the year that I was going to graduate and or the year before I graduated and then we got married I graduated in May and we got married in June of the next year after he proposed and so the first year we um, rented a house together I started my job at the big four public accounting he was at a job that he wasn't super passionate about and so he said I'm going to go to firefighter school and I'm going to become a firefighter and so I obviously supported this and um, you know we did this whole firefighting school thing together and then he um, got a job as a firefighter in Corpus Christi Texas have you ever heard of it (laughs) No, yeah, I've heard. Of well, I know you have, but maybe a lot of people won't. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's by it's like a small town, small ish on the beach. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, there's really that's all there is to say about it. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. I think Whataburger was founded there. Or Whataburger was, was founded in Corpus Christi. Yes. So, um he got a job as a firefighter in a small town outside of Corpus Christi and we moved not there. even Corpus Christi it was it's, it was called Portland Texas I think that's Portland what, I that's, think that's funny I like honestly can't even remember the name of yeah I think it was Portland so you did you have to quit your job and stuff so I quit my job at the big like there are four big accounting firms in the entire world and I worked at one of them and I mean that's what you do when you're an accountant. You work at the big four and you work really hard and make your way with your career at through the big four. So I had, I quit my job. I got a job at a super, super tiny accounting firm in Corpus. And, um, we bought a house. We bought a house together, not just rented a house. We bought a house together. And then pretty much as soon as I moved down there, he just became this person that I didn't even know existed in him. So he would drink more than you should drink to the point of... Was he an alcoholic? I don't know if he was an alcoholic. I mean, I feel like before Corpus, he liked to drink, he liked to party. 
but it was um, on a whole nother level in Corpus to the point where he wouldn't come home for like nights on end. And so what? Yeah, he wouldn't come home. Where, where, did you find out where he was? I guess I'll let you continue. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, I'm sure I'm sure he was with other women. I don't know where he was, but I mean, you think he was with other women? I don't know. There's no like I can only tell you the fact. The fact is that he did not come home. What the And the fact F. is that he he did not come home. So, mm. I mean, you can put two I I never have proof if he was with other women, but Did you ever ask him? Yeah, and he would say no, but I mean, pff, you're not coming home. <laughs> yeah. So, like here I am in this city all by myself, this city that's I don't even like, all by myself. I moved here for my husband who is drinking to the point of oblivion and not coming home. And it was the most devastating time of my life. Like I cannot even tell you how devastating it was. Like my whole life changed based off of decisions that another person was making. This other person was deciding to drink and party and put all of that ahead of our marriage and ahead of our eight year relationship. Um, so he would drink so much to the point that he would not come home. And I can honestly count on one hand how many times I remember him coming home. And I was there for three months. I was there from October to December. That's how quickly it yes derailed. yes for i can't uh, to this day and I you bought not, a freaking house and i moved my career um <sighs> both <laughs> i cannot tell you why he did what he did like i do not know why he did what he did to this day i don't know but that's just something that i have to live with like i have to be strong enough in myself to say i won't ever get an apology or I won't ever have an answer or I won't ever know why. And I just have to be long, strong enough to say it doesn't matter. Like at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. It's over regardless. Yeah. Um, so it got to the point where when he was driving home, he would drunk. Yeah. He would, um, his truck, he would, he would try to park his truck in our driveway and it would be like half in the grass, half on our driveway. And I was just like, what is this? Like, what is happening? And I don't know. I don't know what was. He was going through something and he made decisions that he didn't want me to be part of his life anymore. And that was the decision that he made. But he handled it in a way that was the worst possible way you could handle it. And so then one day... um, he came home, I don't know, maybe like seven o'clock in the morning. And he was supposed to be at his shift at nine o'clock in the morning for the, at the fire station. And I was leaving for, it was like seven thirty, and I was leaving for work and he was passed out on the couch. And I was like trying to wake him up. Cause I was like, you've got to go do your fire shift. Like you've got to go to your shift. And he was like not waking up and I was shaking him and saying, you've got to get out of, you've got to get off the couch and you have to go do your shift. And he, it kind of just put things into perspective for me because he wanted to be a firefighter so bad. And here he is like not even putting his firefighting career first. Like he, if it wasn't for me, he would have slept through his shift at work. And so it really was just like, okay, this is the final straw. Like this is bigger than me. He's putting, he's ruining our marriage. He ruined our marriage. And if it wasn't for me, he would have missed his fire shift and he would have ruined his career because he was brand new. He'd only been at the fire station for like a month or two. And so, I mean, you can't miss a shift because you're passed out on your couch (laughs) drunk, you know? But was he drunk when he woke up and went to a shift? I don't know, probably. And so Mm. if he wasn't drunk, he was hung over. But so then that was a day that I was like, I can't do this anymore. And this situation is bigger than 
me. It's bigger than our relationship. He's damaging his career. And so I packed up like my stuff and I drove. You didn't tell him anything? Yeah, I, I, I first I had to go to work still because <laughs> I had to say I'm quitting. And like if it's okay for me not to have two weeks, like if it's okay for this to be my last day, like work didn't know any of this. Like I'm not about to go spilling to my boss that my husband is an alcoholic drunk who won't come home at night. And so like they had no idea. And so I, um, I went to work and I told my boss and I said, look, I'm, I'm really sorry that this happened and I'm really sorry that I'm quitting, but I, I need to emotionally take care of myself and I need to be with my family and I need to go back to Austin. Like I can't do this and I can't be in this city that I don't know anybody by myself. And so thankfully she understood completely and she was the kindest person and she said, don't even stay two weeks, just get out of here and go be with your mom. And I was like, okay, thank God. And so then on the way out to Austin, I stopped at the fire station and I told him that I can't do it anymore and that I can't be in this city by myself and I can't be um, leading this life by myself when we're in a committed relationship. And I said that um, if he gets help, then I'll come back. But if he doesn't get help, then I want a divorce. And um, he said, okay. And he said, I don't need help. So I guess we're getting a divorce. And I said, okay. And then I drove away and I drove to my parents' house and I stayed with my parents for, um, I stayed with my parents for a long time, but I didn't have a job for a month. So for a month, I got myself together. I got myself back on my feet. I went to therapy. I cried a lot. I had to explain. I had to tell the story to 5 million people because they they didn't know me as an individual. They knew me as a couple because I had been in a, this relationship since I was 16. And so, like, I wasn't Megan. I was Megan and my ex's name. Like, they didn't know me as a person. They knew me as a unit. And so I had to explain this story to my family. I had explained the story to my friends from high school, my friends from college, my ex-coworkers wanted to know where I was. My other coworkers from my first job wanted to know why I was back in Austin. Like you literally have to explain the story a trillion bazillion times. And um that's one of the hardest parts of having to tell the story like a million times. If it makes you feel better, well I've always only thought of you as like Megan because I actually didn't get to know said person very well. Oh, thanks. And you were only at AM and I and we only hung out as girlfriends. And so I never thought of you. Thank you. And that. Um so then I what like one of the first days that I was back home with my parents I um, was just like, I'm so thankful to be here. I was just so mm -hmm. thankful to not be in Corpus Christi in that stupid house all by myself. <laughs> I was just so glad to be at home. And so then after a month, then I started applying for jobs. And thankfully, it wasn't too much of a difficulty because when you're a CPA and the big four the big four life is like an another life I can't even explain to you. You work a ton and they need all the employees that they can get, thankfully. And so I went back and I worked at a different big four than the one that I did the first time around because I was too embarrassed. I was too embarrassed to go back to the first one that I worked at. Do you feel like you could have? I feel like I could have. I had a good relationship with everybody. I really liked my boss. I really liked all the people that I worked with, but I was just so embarrassed. Like, it was so embarrassing. And like to this but day, no it's one so thinks like, you know, know, you feel that way, but no one else thinks of you that way. I know. 
you know, if anything, he, he's just an asshole. I know. <laughs> and everyone's like, he should be embarrassed, actually. Because that's what I knew everyone thinks. I haven't heard that whole story. I like, I, I, I personally don't like asking other people about those things. And so I just never do unless people tell me them. Yeah. Because I feel like if they wanted to, they would express themselves. And if they don't, like they won't. And they just don't. So. Yeah. But now it's been like five, four or five years. And I mm-hmm. just feel like I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. And I wouldn't be here if all of that hadn't happened. And if the timing wasn't exactly as it was supposed to be, I would not be here right now. I would not be in Seattle. I would not, you would not have a podcast. You would have a different co-host. Like everything happened at the exact time that it was supposed to happen so that I could be here right now. Mm -hmm. I believe that in life too. Yeah. Um, So you feel like you learned a lot? I learned so much. I also learned one of the biggest things I had to take away from this was um, I obviously went to therapy a lot and I kept on asking her, I'd say, because I obviously am in a committed relationship right now and I am going to be in this committed relationship for the rest of my life because I still get sad about my first marriage because I grew up with him. and Yeah, that's really difficult. I mean, my heart was smashed into a million pieces Mm -hmm. and so um I asked her why do I still feel so sad when I am so incredibly happy with Desmond and when Desmond is like this ray of light and trust and honesty and she said well you can as human beings we all have 10,000 different emotions at the same time And it's okay. And it's okay for you to like Starbucks coffee and to like coffee that you make at your house. You still like both, but it's okay. You can like different things. You can like one thing and like another at the same time. And it's okay for you to feel sad that the marriage didn't work out and really happy that you're in this new relationship that is you feel 100% trust in. And she was just explaining to me how it's okay that we, as human beings, we're not just down this one narrow black and white path where all of our emotions make perfect sense. And she was just saying that it's okay to have all of these different emotions at the same time. I admire your strength. Thank you. You were so strong and I feel like it taught you to be who you are and... It did. I mean... There's no reason to feel embarrassed. I, I get why you feel embarrassed because even I feel embarrassed at my, like my long term breakups. But like he was a jerk. In the end he was. And so that's why I can't say if he truly loved me like all mm. the way back through the whole time because how in the world could you do that to somebody that you loved? Like how? And he would Yeah, the way he did it was really poor. And like he the there was only a couple of times where he would talk to me while we were in Corpus Christi like he just straight up would not talk was it like that before you don't have to answer this in the podcast I guess but was it like that before where like he wouldn't bef- talk to me yeah before you moved to Corpus was it just like a polar freaking opposite like when you were in Austin you guys were happy yes. and like affectionate and then yes. you moved to Austin and communication just randomly cut off yes Ugh. god that's That's like a mind death. So the only time that he would talk to me was one of the first nights that he didn't come home. And I, that, that night, like he said, I'm going to be home at 10 or whatever time he said he was going to go out with his firefighter friends. And he said, I'm going to be home at 10. Well, 10 came and he didn't come home. 11 came and he didn't come home. And I was calling him and I was texting him. And then like two o'clock, he didn't come home. And here I am like not sleeping because I'm worried. Like, where is he? Were you texting him this whole time or calling him? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I called my mom and I was like free. Like I was having a panic attack because I was like, I'm in this city all by myself. My husband is not coming home. I don't know where he is. Well, first you're just worried about him. Yes. And so my parents drove down because I was having a panic attack. And um, and it's a long drive, but they drove down. What a jerk. And so that morning, my parents were there. And he came home <laughs> around like 
eight o'clock or so. <laughs> Welcome back. And so we went to like we were ta- my parents were trying to talk to him and like say like what's going on and what are you like what are, why are you doing this to Megan? And like the only thing he could say was that he feels like he has two personalities inside of him and one personality wants to be with me and wants to treat me the correct way and wants to be a good husband and the other personality doesn't want to do that and the other personality wants to party and do who knows what with other people and right now that the other personality is winning and that's all he would say what a jerk well yeah so your 20s are rough your 20s are rough um that's rough that is rough. So I guess we'll move, we'll kind of skip around like personal experiences. Um, I guess I'll tell my personal breakup stories. Now we're in breakout corner. <laughs> uh, I don't know if I'll go into as much depth because I didn't think I would go into much depth, but okay. um, we'll see. Um, so I have been in love two times. Yeah. And I, looking back on it, um, I have nothing bad to say about these two individuals, which I think I'm very blessed. Uh, I don't think I used to feel that way. Yeah. I was pretty mad at one of them. Um, But he, um, so we were in a relationship and I've never talked about it in public. So this is weird. Um, He was, we were in a relationship from 16 to 22 so from like my high school sweetheart through like my last bit of college and I do feel like he was in love I was in love first so throughout all of high school high school was good and we went to Texas A&M together and honestly I remember that conversation and I don't remember know if he remembers this, it this way but I remember like deciding to go to A&M and he made that decision a little bit because of me mm-hmm. and he was like I love you and I don't want to be apart so let's go to A&M together mm-hmm. so we went to A&M and that first year at A&M was like the best year of our relationship it was really we were dating for like five years I guess maybe six um and so it was the best year of our relationship and I was like we were both super happy and then at the end of that year um I was also like, I've always been a feminist. And so like, I wasn't going to make, and this might've been the breaking point of our relationship. So maybe I screwed, maybe in his eyes, I kind of screwed it up, but, um, I decided to go to the university of Oklahoma because, um, I felt like my career path wasn't at A&M because A&M is more math and science and business Mm -hmm. and they didn't really have a J school or journalism school and Mm -hmm. I really wanted to pursue being a journalist and I had like an existential crisis because I was obsessed with the University of A&M like yeah freaking obsessed I thought it was great and it is great I still don't think of it any less um but I was devastated to transfer because I was like the happiest I had ever been I was surrounded by Aaron and Chelsea and you and Mm -hmm. all of our friends there and the sorority I was really enjoying. I was an officer, actually. Do you remember that? No. I was, like, the uh, event officer. Oh, cool. Where I did the external, like, fundraiser things. And, like, father-daughter baseball. Fun. That position. I forget what that position was called. So um, I did that position. And then I had to give it up and transfer it to someone else. I forget who I gave it to. But so I was devastated to make that decision but I knew it was the right one in my gut like I bawled my eyes out and I remember like when I had made that decision like having to tell oh I almost said his name (laughs) having to tell him um I was terrified that we were going to break up right then Mm -hmm. but he said he was supportive in that moment and we did long distance through my senior year he graduated a year later Um, but through my senior year, we made it through and I like had a plan for us in my head. I was like going to apply to the Bryan college station, Waco television stations, which are reasonable television stations to start your career in. And I was going to be there while he finished up his degree and we could like be in that area and he could find a job in that area, wherever he was going to be. And I remember like on Valentine's day, he had planned like 
something pretty elaborate and it was pretty normal. And I had like no idea he was like feeling any different. And we went on the Valentine's Day and he was like a little quiet, but I thought, whatever, he's in a bad mood. Cause like we were doing long distance where we would drive to see each other like six hours right. every other weekend. It was really painful. The whole college experience the next night. So like Valentine's Day was Friday night. Um, and he had did this at our favorite spot, which was my favorite spot in town. It was like at the airport where you could watch cause where I'm from, like the DFW airport is, and you could watch all the planes take off and stuff. So it was like my favorite lookout spot. Mm-hmm. And we had Valentine's the day there. And that was one of our first dates. So it was like a really sentimental spot. And so we went there and, um, he planned this thing. He had dessert. He he cooked dinner. And so I thought, like, good to go. You know, like, everything's yeah. good. I didn't think anything was different. And he, like, came over, spent the night. And then the next day we were at, like, one of the local bars that uh, we both loved. And he was just being really quiet. And I was like, what's wrong? Like, I kept asking him, what's wrong? Like, why are you in a bad mood? You know, but I didn't think it was, like, something life-changing, you know? Right. I was just like, what's what's wrong? And he was like, I don't feel the same about us anymore. I don't have any negative feelings toward him anymore. Um, I did for a solid two to three years. Yeah. Or two years, because we broke up in 2014. It's 2017. But now, like, and now looking back, I don't feel angry at him anymore. I don't feel, like, as upset about it anymore. And... I'm almost thankful that I was my first relationship with was with such a nice person because I think he is a nice person and I'm grateful that that first relationship was good. I think it's just we were young. It's hard to be in long distance when you're that college age. I don't fault him like it's understandable. That's really big of you. Um, and, but I was pissed. At him. <laughs> I was that's, mad. I think that that's fine. To be um, um, but now I'm just not mad and I'm like hope he's happy mm-hmm. I hope he's all good I don't think I would want to necessarily like be BFF but like right. I hope he's happy um, I hope my ex is happy too yeah I hope he's happy so and yeah but my other ex was like a different I've had dated in between these people but none of them are love like these were the serious ones um but um He, this other guy that my second serious relationship was my best friend for a very long time prior, but it was like very platonic. Like we didn't have like nothing romantic. We were very respectful of each other. Like it was very like friendly and we had such a firm foundation of respect and friendship and a true like love for each other. That was not necessarily romantic at first. We really felt platonic toward each other and we like loved each other, but it was like, not romantic and then like and then I moved away to Colorado for my first job and we both realized we started to develop feelings for each other that spring before I moved out Mm -hmm. and um and then he drove up there and confessed his feelings and we started dating for a few years um a few years no a year and a half I guess yeah a year and a half sorry that's okay that's close to a few years (laughs) um and Um, it was a very healthy relationship the whole time. And I think we ended it when we started to drift apart pretty quickly after we started to drift apart. And I think what's devastating about that relationship, and I did love him very like in a romantic sense. Um, but now like I've moved on, but, um, I'm sad that that friendship also had to end I guess you made that we made that decision when we decided to make it romantic yeah but both of us naively thought we could be friends afterward Mm -hmm. and then we just grew apart well I mean that one is a really big that one's really hard Mm -hmm. I don't think that right now you guys could be friends because I think maybe it's still so new yeah it was a year ago actually we broke up a year ago really yeah it's that long Mm mm-hmm do you think that like you would ever want to just say, how, see how he's doing? Yeah, we've we texted afterward for a few months, just like as friends, because we were trying to be friends. Mm-hmm. And then he kind of faded off, be, but he was like pretty confident that he wanted to stay friends. Um, it was also, uh, by the way, it was also a very long distance relationship, and that relationship was long distance the whole time romantically. 
but we went to OU together. But um, what's up with long distance as uh, some long distance relationships? Not a good mix. That's why yeah. I was like, as soon as I fell in love with Des, I was like, I got to get my butt to Seattle oh, right yeah. this second. <laughs> long distance is rough. Um, and I thought I could make it work every time. <laughs> I think the hard part about long distance is that whenever you're apart, you miss each other so much. And then when you're together, it's like a vacation all the time. So you don't know what real life is because. Oh, absolutely. Because apart, you're like, oh my gosh, I miss this person. You're just like longing for this person. And then when you're together, you're just like, this is Disney World 24 seven. I'm so in Only love. going on dates. Yeah. It's kind of like The Bachelorette. <laughs> it is kind of like The Bachelorette. It's like you're not living real life. You know, yeah. you don't have to see this person you see them through their struggles, but their struggles are five hours away or however long away you are. And then it's different to like be them, be there and physically be there with them when they're in their struggles. I feel like my maturity that I will struggle with um, is like being in like because my whole relationships that were serious were all long distance. So like how am I going to like... What oh, is it yeah. like to date? Not how am I? What is it like to date someone in the same town? Like, what does that mean? You know, like, yeah. how like, often you do you don't... see each other? Like, what is it really like? Like, so we see each other every day. Well, you live together. We live together. <laughs> but um, I think that the big difference is that you really have to find quality time to be together because it's one of those things where it's like, Oh, I live with him. So I need to make quality time with Chelsea. I need to make quality time with Kenzie, with Allie, with Brianna for yoga. Like I purposefully make quality time with all of these people because I don't live with them and I don't get to see them all the time. But then it's like, no, um, maybe some days we're only see each other when we're like, okay, good night. Love you. Like that's maybe the only time that we see each other. So then you do need to make quality time with this person. Or you'll grow apart. Or you'll grow apart. And so that's why last night was really important for us because, you know, we, yeah, we had dinner with Amanda and Jeff, but we had an hour and a half drive there and an hour and a half drive back. And so just like taking the time to find quality time and also realizing that some days you're going to be grouchy and some days they're going to be grouchy. Right. And sometimes it just, that's just what you got to do. Like you're not going to be happy and you're not going to be joyful and it's not going to be fun 24 seven. I think that's the big thing is it's not going to be fun 24 seven. But we're also just talking about our twenties, not just about dating. Um, this is going to be a long podcast because we have other stuff to get into. So now we're going to just kind of talk about, uh, different things you feel in your twenties. So feeling lost, not sure about your career relationships and finances. I'm kind of just going to go down the list and then maybe we can come back to each one and kind of relate to them. Um, isolation dash comparing yourself. So like just feeling alone in certain new places because a lot of people will move for their career or just pick a new place besides their hometown and they'll just feel isolation or maybe you'll be in your hometown but all of your friends leave, you know, like isolation, that feeling of being alone and comparing yourself to other people at your age. So that's an isolating feeling as well. There's personality forming experiences, like both of our relationships helped us be the strong ladies we are today. Um, And lack of security, career formation, and yeah. So what are different things we've gone through? As far as my other, I think the other things I've gone through are isolation, career changes, and feeling uh like I'm comparing myself and lack of security I feel like I've always felt those have you felt those at a certain time I think comparing yourself is a really big one because you you yeah you can compare yourself to other people your same age and say oh my gosh they bought a house they have kids already they have they're in a marriage that that's working and they've been married for four plus years now, whatever. And so just really compare when I look at that and when I compare myself to other people, my age, it can be really difficult, but then I have to just say, no, I have so much positive experiences in my life and I am exactly where I'm supposed to be. And it's okay that I have an apartment and I don't have a house and it's okay that my first marriage didn't work. Absolutely. And so I think that really comparing yourself to others can really, have a negative impact on your 
on your life. And like knowing that you feel embarrassed, like you feel embarrassed because you're going through it. But like, it's also important to remove yourself and know that most people are focused on themselves. Most right. people are selfish. So they're worried about the other things that are embarrassing him that you don't even think is embarrassing. I know. <laughs> Like your marriage, like I've always thought of you as straight up Megan. And I was like, that really blows. And I like felt like sympathy for you, but never like embarrassment. Yeah. I was right. never like, oh, that's embarrassing. If anything, <laughs> I was like, that dude should be embarrassed because he's it's an idiot because Meg's a queen. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um, f- so feeling lost. I felt a lot of these things like for my career, I'll go into career right now. So for career, I've made a lot of decisions and I've had a lot of life forming experiences in themselves. So naturally, and I think this began like me challenging myself in the formative years began when I transferred from A&M to OU because I was so comfortable at A&M and it was almost like a second home because I lived with all the people that made me comfortable. Mm -hmm. But I think I had to find myself and become the person I was by moving um, to OU. And so I moved to OU without really, I mean, there were people from high school there, but I didn't, I wasn't like super like we're happy now. And we like, and I met them at OU and we're like, Oh, Hey, what's up? But um, you weren't BFF. I wasn't friends with them really in high school. Um, and so, cause our high school was large. It wasn't like, we didn't like each other. It was just big. And then, um, and so then I had to make new friends who I'm obsessed with. Amy, Kaylee, um, Brianna, Hannah, all these people, um, I'm like obsessed with. And you would have never done, done that if you hadn't moved to OU. Yeah. And so these women actually have played a big role in my life. Um, and, uh, so I moved there and then after college I have been, I like, I even cried when my parents just considered moving houses within the same city, like (laughs) bawled my freaking eyes out. So that's how little I liked moving. And so it was a real challenge to myself. Then I moved to Colorado Springs. I had never been to the state of Colorado. I just accepted a job after school. Why did you, how did you apply for that job? I don't remember. I just applied randomly online. You did? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cause you have to move in the broadcast field. So I knew I was going to move somewhere weird. So, so you knew like, you were going to move anyway. So, so I just picked towns that I thought were kind of unique and cool, even though they were really, they were smaller. Right. Colorado Springs isn't really small, but even though they were smaller, I picked towns that I think I would like to live in. And so like I just mapped out and I applied a bunch of places in the United States. I thought I actually applied for Corpus. Oh, (laughs) but I got a rejection from Corpus actually. Corpus Christi rejected me. We could have lived at Corpus Christi together and just cried. Just like (laughs) I would have called you. I'm just like, I'm going to come over and cry for five hours. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. And so I actually got two job offers after school. Um, one was to be in Sherman, Texas, which was a tiny uh, town near DFW. It's like oh. two hours away. Um, so I would have been comfortable like the same distance as Wichita Falls was away, but different areas. So um, I could have been far. Um, so I had that Sherman, Texas move or I had the... Colorado Springs offer so I moved to Colorado Springs and I learned a lot about myself I fell in love with the mountains and that's why I wanted to come out here a big reason I loved exploring and hiking and stuff and I just loved how beautiful they were I had never seen the state of Colorado I've never seen a legitimate mountain either um I didn't know a freaking soul literally no one I moved into an apartment by myself um I was a hundred percent alone oh my god it's 22 years old that's crazy. And so I, it was so liberating though. I went to bars by myself. I went to movies by myself until I made friends with my coworkers and they're really great. Um, those coworkers are wonderful. Um, and so, yeah. That's really bold of you. Yeah. It was, it was insane. It was an insane year, but it was a good year. Um, and formative for my career because it was upsetting and I battled through and still wanted to pursue journalism. And so I knew So my next career move was they ended up not putting me on air. I was just an online personality. So I moved to, um, uh, so I moved then to Wichita Falls to pursue my, my goal of being on air. And I learned so much about myself there. I grew as a journalist. I ended up writing a lot of stuff. I made some changes in the community. I told some great stories. Um, I grew 
in shooting and writing. I developed lifelong friendships with the people there. And I truly love my friends at the station from Wichita Falls with all of my heart. And um, I got to be good friends with videographers and know what it means to work on as a team. And that was really formational. And it helps as a co-host as a podcast because um, I worked with someone on a team every single day. Right. Um, and you have to really be receptive to their wants. And I really respect those men that were, it was one woman, but she was very brief. But those men that were my videographer team with me, I really love them. They were all sweet dudes. Um, and so that experience was wonderful. I did Hotter in Hell. I de- developed my own series of like television series based on that, of like opening up personally about it. Um I felt more comfortable going out without makeup. I like grew as a person. I just, it was great experience. Um, um, but I did my own research and I try to be very cognizant of myself, which I think has helped me through my relationships and has helped me through life in general. And, um, I, I realized that television isn't doing as well. I was very uh, perceptive to how our generation is. No one's sitting down and watching the 5 p.m. newscast and no one's watching the 6 p.m. newscast. I'm not saying whether it will actually ever go away fully or I'm not saying that it won't morph into something else and those jobs will still be there. But I think it was very unstable. I think it could be very unstable and I do think there's a possibility that it could fade away. Um, and I don't know what that will look like, but I decided where would I really want to live? I still want to be in some form of storytelling and video production. And I want to still do journalism outside of my job, like this podcast, because I consider this podcast another job. I generally do. Like I put, we both put in a ton of hours into this. Um, and so where would I be happiest doing that? Seattle. Seattle. So that's what led me here. And so I, I've i moved around a lot. And Wichita Falls was kind of a decision where I knew it was attainable. I knew it was close to family and my ex at the time. And so I those were formative moments. So many. And I that was like a brief summary. But yeah. So it I went through feeling lost in my relationship. And journalists don't get paid. If you think that being on TV makes you paid, it doesn't. It's a lie. I was surprised that you, because I asked you if they would pay for your clothes or pay for your makeup because, you know, you have they to do look. the anchors, but not oh, the they reporters. Do the anchors. Yeah. We do our own makeup in here, which is also a thing that people don't think is real. Back in the day, it might have been different. And in the larger market, sometimes it is different. Mm-hmm. But um, in the smaller markets, you have to pay for everything except for. I was lucky and at the two stations I worked for pay for my hair, which is expensive to be blonde. Yep. Mm. But yeah, I got paid to the point where I could be on food stamps that whole time at both jobs. And luckily my parents were willing to push me through that time, but I couldn't have lived without them. And I also realized at 25, I was like, I'm over like asking for, and they would have kept helping me. Right. But I'm over asking for their help. I'm an independent woman. I don't want to feel like this. You know, Mm -hmm. I don't want to, and I could have maybe lived without it, but I would have been like really, it would have been unhappy. You would have been eating ramen every day. Yeah. Did you, and it's a 40 hour work week. Yeah. Plus. Plus, if breaking news happened, you just stayed until, it, but you were hourly. Oh, you were hourly. Some people aren't, but I was hourly. And so like I would be paid over time. But then some people wouldn't be paid over time. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Do you think that our parents, when they were our age, did they watch the five o'clock news? Yeah. And I know oh, they, they did. did. Yeah. So it was like a thing where people sat down because that's the only way you could get it. Whereas now we can just like Google it. In two yeah. Seconds. So imagine if you had no idea what was going on in the world. Yeah. You had to go do other things, but you had no idea. So you need to sit down at some point and, and watch, like, it. watch it. Whereas us, it's just like it, it can literally be a text message can come on our phone and be like, oh, CNN told me that yeah, whatever I got, like, is three happening. Texts this morning about news. And, like, <laughs> right. Yeah. So that's why. Yeah. So now I'm in the online video production world and I'm in the online and podcast. So perfect. Perfect. Um, what about you for your job changes, your, your career changes? Um, my, I haven't changed. I've always been an accountant and I've always been a CPA. Um, I guess for me, the really hard thing was straight up having to quit my job in Corpus Christi and take that month off and then 
trying to explain what that month off meant and just trying to say, okay, look, I'm not this crazy girl who can't keep a job. You know, I'm not this lady who's just going to be out of here in a day. And so just having somebody had to, to believe in me and believe that it was for personal reasons only that I would had to jump between jobs like that. It had nothing to do with my performance. It had nothing to do with my relationships with my boss. All of those were positive, but somebody really had to, um, to accept that and to say, okay, I believe that this girl just went through a personal time, but I don't think that she's this crazy girl bouncing between 10 jobs in 10 days or whatever. Yeah. You probably have also had to explain that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I have 13 things women in their 30s want women in their 20s to know from the Huffington Post. Oh, girls, tell us. 30 y'all. Okay. Tell us. I'll tell you. Okay. The first one is do whatever you can to avoid judging other women. What we just talked about. Yes. Let's do it. Put money in your 401k, even if it's just a little bit. And even if you feel broke now, which we've we've talked about it in multiple podcasts. Yeah. To put money in your 401k. Yeah. But when you do spend money, keep in mind that you'll remember your 20s based on experiences you had more than the stuff that you actually buy. Exactly. So I think that that's a big one because um, I like to spend my money on going to dinner, going to drinks, going to get coffee. And so it is. And you do. You remember those times that you have with your friends more than, oh, look at this purse I bought. <laughs> it's true yeah I actually just dropped a lot on my credit card right now RIP um, <laughs> to and I if my friend's listening it's like no I, it's 100% worth it and I'm so excited about it and I'm so happy to do it but I'm going to a bachelorette party but it was like super expensive to go in Texas like the plane ticket but I'm oh, going yeah. man because I'm excited for my friend and I want to be there with her and uh, it'll be great perfect yeah it's okay to whittle down your friendships to a few core people that you need. And so I think in college, we were like, we need 500,000 friends. Because of social to, media. Yeah. And we need to be with them all the time. Mm -hmm. And so now we're like, hey, let's just have those people in our lives who are we can be our true selves with, who we can be the most positive with. And so it's okay to whittle down that ginormous group of friends that you did have in college. Can I make a different point that I was going to make yeah. real fast? Um, friends, that was another one. It's okay in your 20s, and I went through this too. I'm not going to go into detail with that, but um, like friends that I had to make the decision that I had, it wasn't healthy for me mentally be, to be in those friendships as well. Yeah. So I had to end a few friendships. And then it just it's hard growing apart from others, just like ones you didn't intentionally grow away, grow away from. Um, and a lot of people, I feel like that did happen. Um, but then at the same time, knowing which friendships you want to maintain. And even though it takes, sometimes you don't talk for a few months that it's still there, you know? Yeah. And those are the people that you want to surround yourself with. For sure. This next one's kind of funny. Okay. Don't judge older women for spending money on eye cream. <laughs> I don't think I ever have. I'd be like, go sister. Like some of my friends are like, start it now. Yeah. And wear sunscreen every single day. Oh my God. Wear yeah. sunscreen. I, I'm, we're both super pale. So super I've pale. had it like, I have a few scars from moles. I've had a, like that were really sketchy. Remember those pictures from college that you messaged me and I said, oh, I was so much prettier back then than I am now. Mm -hmm. Well, part of the reason that I think that is because we would go in the tanning beds back then and we would make ourselves really tan and pretty like year round. Oh, I only did it for two special occasions in my life. Oh, Prom no, and Chelsea's wedding. No, girl, we no, did I, it all the time. You did it? I didn't do it all the time, but uh, half the year. Dang. Yeah. And so looking back on it, I was like, oh, look at my pretty tan skin. Should I do it now again? And I live right by a tanning salon. No, like no, literally. No. I know I'm not gonna do it I am not gonna do it see over these past few years though after all that like people still make fun of me for about how pale but that like people making fun of me actually I that literally has I don't care <laughs> yeah it doesn't bother me anymore at all um but um I am like rock in the pale. I'm just like, yeah, I'm pale. And I think I'm, I look like Snow White. Let's both just rock the pale. I'm like, Snow White. Who cares? Yeah, I don't care. The next one is Sheryl Sandberg was right. The person you choose to spend your life with is the most important career decision you will make. 
Your life will be significantly harder if you don't have someone who believes in your path as much as you do. That's great. Making sure you have a strong partner to support you and you can support them. Don't worry so much. 90% of the stuff you spend your time worrying about truly doesn't matter. And I think we can all raise our glasses to that one. Mm, Seriously. Okay, so I have a few more things. First thing, good things that happen in your 20s. Not everything's bad. There's so (laughs) many good parts of your 20s. Um, These are just goofy ones, though. No homework. No homework. You graduate school mostly and you have no homework unless you choose to go to graduate school or you choose to be a rock star and be a doctor. Um, But no homework, really. Um, Freedom. I've been free to go wherever I want. Mm Mm-hmm. I've moved a lot. Um, and dessert for dinner. You could have cupcakes for dinner. Or cereal for dinner. Yeah. Which I've done. <laughs> Whatever you want. Okay. Um, thanks to trying your 20s. And this isn't a hard or fast rule, but this is what I have my advice from learning in my 20s. And I'm only halfway through. <laughs> um, try new things. So, like, the things I tried formed who I was and not being afraid to try those things or being afraid and doing them anyway. Saying yes to new experiences. So be conscious of when there's a good opportunity and even if it might scare you to try to say yes. Um, Say no to things that are negative. Um, So feel confident in knowing that sometimes you can say no if you're uncomfortable or if it just doesn't make you happy. Learn more, like be absorbing at your jobs and try to really uh, strive in them and to make changes in your career and like offer the company new things or offer, if you're freelancing, just like take yourself to the next level. Um, To travel, I haven't really traveled because I haven't been able to afford it, but um, I have definitely moved around um, to brand new places Um, and a volunteer So volunteer to learn more about your community and volunteer just volunteering is important. And I feel like people are worried that our generation isn't going to, um, which speaking of, I need to find an organization here. I'm pretty new here, but I do want to volunteer eventually. Um, And then this is my own advice from what I've learned and just to like kind of talk about it. So to be perfectly honest and open in this podcast, I'm going to try to be as transparent, even though it's really difficult because I'm a pretty open person actually online, but um, I realized that I actually don't talk about the negatives. So it's hard for me, even though uh, like the things are difficult for me to talk about. So um, I've had depression in my 20s. I've been depressed. Um, I have had ang- severe anxiety and I my doctor told me, and it's just by one doctor, so I should probably research it to see if it's actually legitimate, but my doctor to, uh, diagnosed me with obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, and so I do have OCD, um, and I am on antidepressants that control the OCD. Um, it's intended to not be an antidepressant, but to control the uh, OCD. Um, and so, but with that, you have to be careful because if you switch it, you, and switch around on different medications and you have to be careful to find the right one because you could, uh, suffer from more depression or suicidal thoughts. Um, so being okay to pop a pill if you need one and knowing that it is okay to talk about mental health issues. It's okay to be out there and not feel like you're insane to, talk about these things like my particular disorder is one I overthink things and obsess about things um severely and one of the things it was I counted as well I would I was like a counter I'm not necessarily OCD cleanly wise like it doesn't bother me for a mess but like um once I got into something I would be obsessive or I would like check how much the oven was on or check how many times the door was locked and I would go back and check it. Even though you just did. And I had to count to five. And if you look on the old things that I used to study and how I used to study in college, I had, whether I knew it well or not, I ha- had to study it five times. I had to. And I would have tally marks on all of my sheets of paper of how, how many, many times, times I studied, studied it. it. Had to be five. That's, that's interesting. And so, yeah, I have OCD and 
anxiety, which I haven't worked on figuring out that one as well, but um, anxiety. Another thing is do things that scare you. So uh, try to do things that are different and that like intimidate you. Um, Act on your dreams and do the work it will take to get you there. I think a lot of things that are limiting is like doing the work that it'll actually take you to get there. Like this podcast actually intimidated me to be able to share this part of myself and to also just be able to put yourself out there um, because I've been through things that weren't successful. And so just do things, just do it, do it because it makes you happy. Um, Be vulnerable when appropriate. Um, Learn from your downfalls, be open to everyone and everything like people and accepting of others it's totally okay to not have it figured out or to change or to make mistakes it's okay to not have it figured out um talk to people about it which i haven't done therapy i think would be helpful for anyone like anyone therapy is literally the best thing in the world it doesn't have to be that you're going through a thing um but i think i should go uh sleep more like take time to sleep be cognizant of your feelings and what you're going through and the decisions that you're making just be cognizant of it um get medical help when you need it like i had to be diagnosed with these things and you're never too old to change your mind on work you're never too old even despite your 20s to change your mind on work your relationships and do it all for you and not what other people think so it's okay to make mistakes it's okay to be unemployed Um, no one's, that's more of you judging yourself. No one's judging you. So like, you know, Mm -hmm. unless it is someone who's straight up being a jerk, but maybe that person shouldn't be in your life. Then that's their own problem. Yeah. Okay. So what do you think about all those things? Anything else to add? I think that those are all beautiful and I love every single bit of advice that you gave, including going to therapy. I cannot stress that enough. Which I should probably go to. (laughs) Take your own advice, girl. I know. I'm the worst. Okay. Um, Do you want to end on a positive? Kinsey, what's your positive? Getting back into cycling. Yay. Yay. I'm so excited that I am, even though I hurt my shoulder actually in class yesterday because I went to one of those like intense cycling gyms and they have like weights on either side and you're supposed to like do a shoulder workout and all that stuff. And yesterday was a shoulder workout, but sometimes it's like buys and tries and stuff with your arms because you're working your legs so much. Um, so I think I pulled my shoulder and it hurts. So be careful with your body. Yeah, That's be another careful with your body. big thing to do in your 20s is be careful with your body. Oh yeah, be smart about it. Um, what's your good thing? My good thing is the harmonium. And on August 13th, I get to play the harmonium and chant in yoga church again. And Amanda and Jeff are coming down for my birthday. And so I'm for sure going to make Amanda come to class and chant with her. And she's also going to be forced on to this podcast. And she's going to be our guest that week on the podcast. And I'm, I'm so really excited, excited about that podcast. Just in general. And we'll celebrate your birthday. Perfect. Okay. Um, what's our positive quote? It's from Lena Denham. Positive, healthy, loving relationships in your 20s. I don't know if anyone would disagree with it, but I think they're the exception, not the norm. People are either playing house really aggressively because they are scared of the uncertain time it is, or they're avoiding commitment altogether. Yep. Be vulnerable, but also recognize when the relationship is toxic and over. Perfect. Okay. All right. Thank you guys so much. Make sure to subscribe. Follow us on Insta, which Meg runs and she's doing a great job. Follow us on Instagram and follow us on Twitter and Facebook, the Peaceful Truth Podcast. Search for us. Yeah. And subscribe on, we're on SoundCloud and iTunes. So if you have an Android, you can do, um, that, that thing. I think we're also on Google plus, but it's like all is fed through an RSS feed. So I just uploaded it to one site and it's supposed to go out to all these places. Who knows where we are? Um, so make sure to subscribe and give us a review and we love you guys. Be positive, be happy ladies. And thanks for listening. Bye. Bye.